Thanks to all of you for traveling here in the rain. My name is Allison McCardin, and I'm honored to say I'm the executive director of the Epilepsy Foundation in Eastern Pennsylvania. And this morning is quite a symbolic morning for the organization. It's the start, first day of November, and this conference officially kicks off November as Epilepsy Awareness Month. Each year, November is used as a special opportunity to educate the public about epilepsy and issues important to the epilepsy community. Today's Epilepsy Education Exchange initiates an entire month of planned educational and awareness activities. In addition to today's conference, the, this month is jam-packed with support groups, fundraisers, the Philadelphia skyline being lit up in purple, and proclamations being presented throughout the 18 counties that the organization serves. Each day brings a new activity not too late for, for you all to help to join the fight against that. I encourage all of you and take the EFEPA's 30 Days of Awareness Challenge. It starts today and continues for the next 20 days. It includes sharing and spreading information and starting a conversation about epilepsy. Together, let's dare to build a community free of stigma, free of discrimination, and against epilepsy. By this challenge, you will help create a community that's safe and supportive for individuals with seizure disorders. This ideal world doesn't have to be imaginary, but with each of your help, you can help us create it. We've mapped out activities that every one of you can do to help increase awareness about epilepsy, whether it's handing out a flyer, whether it's writing a letter to your local editor at your newspaper, or sharing your Facebook, on stati Facebook status about epilepsy, together we can make epilepsy awareness a reality that lasts well beyond November. If you have any questions, I'd like to refer you to Mary Kate Taylor. She's the organization's information and communications coordinator, and she can talk to you more about the 30-day awareness challenge. And another effort to strengthen the EFEP presence, the organization and its counterparts across America are launching a new logo. You'll see it on the front of your agenda today. The epilepsy flame will go from only incorporating the color red to incorporating the color purple. So many of you for so long have proudly worn purple to represent your commitment to epilepsy. We're very proud to say that our national office has recognized that and that we are finally officially adopting purple as the, as the color of epilepsy. We're also excited about this fresh new look as it represents our ability to adapt to the needs of our constituents and to continue to provide the very best services for those affected by epilepsy. Most recently, our has also adapted to the needs of our constituents by recognizing the influx of questions <coughs> regarding medical marijuana and its potential ability to treat seizures. Back in February, the Epilepsy Foundation of America, along with us here in Pennsylvania, one of its affiliates, put out a, a new press release, put out a press release calling for more research to be done on medical marijuana. And included in this release, we supported an increase in access to, to medical marijuana if recommended by a treating physician. Along with that, we called upon the DEA to implement a lesser schedule for marijuana so more research could be done. As a patient advocacy organization, we listened to the needs of the people with epilepsy and our policy did those, those wishes. Since it's a very complex issue, we decided to focus much of today's annual conference to understanding the issue, and we're fortunate to have strong relationships with experts in the medical community that volunteer to present to us today and help us understand the facts. But before we dive into all of that, I would like to just take a few minutes and give you uh, issues for today or items on the agenda. First, I'd like to thank all of the EFEPA staff that are here. We have people, staff people that came down from Wilkes-Barre to, to be a part of this and make sure the conference runs smoothly. smoothly. We also have staff in here with us along with um, people from Lancaster. Lancaster. I also want to thank Mary Kate for all of the communication that she sent out to you. It seems like we've got an enormous turnout, and we we 
topic has brought a lot of people here today, but we also think the communication that's been put forward organization uh, started earlier this year and has had uh, brought some new faces, faces here. So thank you, Mary Kate, for that. And lastly, I need to thank Sue Livingston. She is responsible for putting together today's agenda and for get, getting our speakers to commit. She also is celebrating her 18th anniversary with the organization. <laughs> staff people we also have great volunteers that are here including our presenters so to our presenters thank you for your time and expertise in joining us this morning our, our sponsors truly help make this this conference possible Lundbeck pharmaceuticals gave us an educational grant they also are here as a vendor our other vendors are CNNH Cyberonics Supernus UCB Pharmaceuticals, Upshur Smith, and Canine Partners. Please make sure if you haven't stopped by to see them that you also chat with them today because they also help to fund, fund this conference. I also have one room change to mention. Dr. Dennis DeLugos, who is speaking about medical marijuana hubbub. He is listed on the agenda to be in Washington A and B. He is going to be in Washington B and C which means Dr. Goldberg, who's speaking on headaches, will be in Washington A. Otherwise, everything else will stay true to the agenda. And we'll do our best to keep this conference running on time and get you out of here. So moving on, our first speakers are Dr. Joyce Liberace and Dr. Erica Marsh. I will start with our lady first. Dr. Joyce Liberace is a neurologist in private practice at Great Valley Neurological Associates. She obtained her medical degree from John Hopkins University and completed her neurology residency and neurophysiology fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Liberace facilitates the EFEPA's Delaware County on a monthly basis and has chaired the foundation's women's conference since its inception back in 1999. Dr. Liberace is a longtime member of the Foundation's Professional Advisory Board. She participates in the Foundation's largest fundraiser every year, which is our summer stroll, by joining us with a team. And she also was recognized by the Foundation with the Eric Burden Osberg Award, a medical professional and everything that she has given to the organization throughout the years. Dr. Eric Marsh, who will be co-presenting with Dr. Liberace, received his undergraduate degree from Haverford College and his MD and PhD from NYU School of Medicine. He completed his pediatrics residency at NYU Bellevue Hospital Center in New York City and then moved to Philadelphia for a child neurology fellowship at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He stayed at CHOP for a clinical and research epilepsy fellowship and then as an instructor of neurology. Dr. Marsh remained at CHOP where he currently directs the neuro neurogenetics clinic and has an epilepsy clinic. He has continued his research on the understanding of genetics and the physiology of the epileptic and encephalopathies. Most recently, Dr. Marsh has been the principal investigator of a study on the effects of cannabidiol in children with Dravet and lennox gastaut syndrome. And so without further ado, I will welcome Dr. Liberace. much and it's hard to believe that Ali had a baby four weeks ago today. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Epilepsy Foundation of Eastern Pennsylvania for inviting me to speak today and it's even more of a pleasure to be able to speak with Dr. Marsh who has a lot of clinical experience with the topic so that's lovely. And I just want to say that Sue, if you st have been with the Epilepsy Foundation for 18 years, you must have started when you were a teenager. <laughs> so today, Dr. Marsh and I will be reviewing uh, several topics, and the overview is that I will be discussing marijuana history and the interest in CBD. I will speak about the medical background and briefly speak about some legal issues. We will emphasize the potential role, of course, in treating epilepsy. 
I will then hand over the podium to Dr. Marsh, and he will be speaking about the biology of CBD and why it may be helpful in epilepsy. He'll also be speaking to us about the preclinical or animal trials, and then the information that we have to date regarding clinical trials in animals. Just as a disclaimer, um, marijuana is illegal under federal law in the United States, and in fact, it is also not legal in the state of Pennsylvania yet. Now the question is why cannabis and really everything changed when Sanjay Gupta aired a documentary called Weed in August of 2013. And with that documentary he stated publicly that he completely changed his mind about marijuana and admitted that he really was ignorant about the topic. And I must admit I'm, I'm guilty of, of the same. And until you start to research marijuana and understand it a little bit better, I think that there's a natural tendency um, to, to perhaps be opposed. But with um, Dr. Gupta, he profiled several families. And most strikingly, um, a little five-year-old girl named Charlotte F Figgy. And Charlotte has Dravé syndrome, which is a devastating epilepsy syndrome. She began having seizures uh, at age one in life and then continued to seize um, continuously despite treatment with numerous anti-epileptic medications. And her parents were told that there were no other options for her, which is painful for, for me to hear. I'm sure devastating for them to hear. And so her father started investigating on his own. He was deployed overseas and um, he came across a video of a patient who had been treated with, uh, with Dravé syndrome um, and was treated with marijuana and seizures improved. And so through a, then a long, very long course, um, Charlotte eventually found her way and to um, a treatment with marijuana and she had a dramatic improvement in her seizures. And if you have the time, you can um, take, take a look at that video, it's available online. And so she used a particular strain of a marijuana plant that actually now is named after her. And so this plant is now called Charlotte's Web, named after uh, Charlotte Figgy, and um, very popular treating patients with epilepsy. And they obtained that plant through a very um, interesting family uh, of actually six brothers, there are only five of them pictured here, but six brothers, the Stanley brothers, and they have been interested in breeding different marijuana plants, and they have been breeding plants that are high in uh, cannabidiol, CBD. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. They were a little reluctant to give the plant to Charlotte because she was so young, only five years old. She was their first um, pediatric patient and in fact their youngest patient. But they were able to extract a resin. Obviously a five-year-old is not going to be smoking marijuana. And so her parents were able to uh, just admit resin by uh, putting it, mixing it with her food. And it was just administered twice a day and remarkably, her seizures reduced dramatically. She was having 50 convulsions a day. Just take a moment to think about that. 50 convulsions every day. And with CBD resin twice a day, she, her seizures reduced down to just two or three seizures at night a month. Dramatic improvement. In addition to the decrease in her seizures, developmentally, she began to excel. So when she started um, with treatment at age four, she was nonverbal and she couldn't walk. And now she is verbal and she's able to ride a bike. So she, she has her life back. Her family, they have their life back now too. Now there are 250,000 to 350,000 identified species of flowering plants um, on our planet. Many have been tested for a variety of uses, including medicinal uses, sometimes uses, psychoactive uses, which means that they alter the mind, used in religious ceremonies, and then of course also for a variety of social pleasures. Now we're interested today in cannabis. Cannabis also is known as pot, hashish, marijuana. And 
naturally in both Central and South Asia. There are two main types, cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. Now what's in marijuana? I was very surprised to learn that there are 489 different compounds in marijuana. There is a distinctive class of compounds called the cannabinoids. There are 70 known cannabinoids in marijuana and they only exist in the cannabis plant. But there are also many other constituents. There are uh, proteins, there are glycoproteins, there is actually even a vitamin in marijuana. Vitamin A is present in the marijuana plant. The major active ingredient in marijuana is THC, and that has been the main mind-altering ingredient. It changes eating habits, it increases appetite, it's an appetite stimulant, it can have anxiety, learning, and memory. Now a typical marijuana plant is high in THC, on average 13%, but breeders have been increasing the amount of THC in plants up to 37%, so, so quite a range in the amount of THC that it can be uh, in, in uh, marijuana. And most plants are low in CBD, containing only one percent of CBD. Now how is marijuana used? Well, the leaves and the flowering tips can be dried and they can be smoked. They can be consumed as a tea. Uh, there are recipe books that you can learn to make marijuana brownies, marijuana butter, really marijuana anything. And you can also, though, get the resin from the flowering heads and the trichomes, which are the little hair-like projections on the plant. And those can be smoked, they can be mixed with tobacco and smoked, or as uh, in Charlotte's case, administered by mouth. A typical marijuana has 0 0.5 to 1 gram of cannabis, and the concentration of THC in, in that joint can vary based on the amount um, in the plant itself, and it can range from 5 milligrams to 150 milligrams, so quite a variety. 20 to 70 percent of the THC will be delivered in the smoke. And just as a reference, uh, two to three milligrams of THC can actually produce a brief high. Now, THC is fat soluble, and so it turns out that it will be deposited into fat tissues. That is the reason why toxicology screens can remain positive for quite a long time, even after no exposure. So once you, you people have exposure to marijuana, their toxicology screen can be positive up to 30 days um, after, after its use. Now CBD is what we're interested uh, in today and that's the component within marijuana that seems to lower seizures. Charlotte's Web is high in CBD. That's been bred over many years to be a plant that contains 17% CBD. It's also low in THC. It's only 0.5% THC. And so it really will not be psychoactive as the THC is. It's been bred to contain high amounts of CBD to help control seizures without making people high. The extraction process is critical. Condition, any condition can affect the plant, and all conditions need to be controlled, including the soil that is grown in, the weather that the plants are exposed to, any pathogens that the, the plants may be exposed to, and then the solvents that are used to um, extract it. All can af affect the final product. There have been reports of intoxication from people uh, trying their own stovetop extractions. There was a um, uh, article in the Seattle Times um, where, where people were in trouble because they were they were buying the plants and trying to extract it themselves in, in their kitchens. Now the history of cannabis goes back for quite a long time. In 4000 BC, it was actually used as a medicine to treat rheumatism or arthritis. In 2700 BC, the Chinese emperor Shen Neng used it for a variety of conditions and reported that it had both yin and yang properties. It was used to treat gout, malaria, rheumatism, and forgetfulness. In the first century AD, the Greeks used it to treat earaches, 
They also made a dessert from it, from the seeds. In India, physicians used it to treat a variety of, of conditions, including fevers, trouble sleeping. It was used for an appetite stimulant, which it still is today, used for epilepsy, headaches, as well as sexually transmitted diseases. In 1841, William B. O'Shaughnessy brought it to, um, to, the, wet, to the West, and uh, he observed its use in India and introduced it in Europe. And it has four variety of medical uses, including epilepsy. Now, I think you'll be surprised that it was actually a valid encounter in the United States until 1937, when the Marijuana Tax Act removed that. that. Act, interestingly, was opposed by the American Medical Association at that time. And in fact, what they wrote was that marijuana was largely an unknown quantity, but might have important uses in medicine. And here we are, and still that statement holds true. We still don't know enough about it, but it probably has some important uses. Now, more modern history, THC was isolated in 1964 in Israel. In 1972, THC was determined as a Category 1 FDA drug, meaning it had no accepted uses. In 1976, Robert Randall was given an investigational new drug um, approval after a court battle, and he wanted it to treat glaucoma. And then in 1996, California legalized cannabis to treat a variety of complaints, including AIDS, cancer, to treat pain and also improve appetite, to reduce muscle density, to treat migraines, and several other disorders. An FDA Schedule I controlled substance uh, is defined as a substance that has high potential for abuse. It has no accepted medical use. It has a lack of accepted safety data, even under medical supervision. And just to put it in perspective, other Schedule I drugs include heroin, LSD, and ecstasy. So that's currently where the federal government is classifying marijuana, an FDA Schedule I. Additional history for epilepsy in the 19th century, Sir John Russell Reynolds and one of my favorite historical neurologists, William Gowers, used cannabis to treat epilepsy. William Gowers is the physician who first described hormonal seizures in catamenial epilepsy. Its use was really not documented well in textbooks, but there is a case report from 1868, a patient, John Kay, a 40-year-old with fits. That was a very common terminology at the time for seizures. He became seizure free when using cannabis indica three times a day and they did report a dose of 9.8 grams, which sounds like quite a high dose to me. Now there are health concerns with cannabis. There's been a concern about addiction should be um, escalating use, the inability to cut back cravings, and harmful consequences, as well as physical dependence. It is thought that the chance of be becoming addicted to marijuana is 9%. And to put that in perspective, the addiction rates with alcohol runs about 23%. The chance of addiction is thought in children, and especially when um, individuals start using marijuana before the age of 16. There are short-term cognitive consequences that last for one to four hours. And these include distortions of object distance, outlines become distorted, becomes difficult to make rapid judgments, reaction time can be slowed, tracking behavior can be impaired, and there's a slowing of perception of time. My perception of time is that it goes too quickly, so slow time perception sounds nice to me. And all of these effects are actually dose-related. Additional health effects. Are we okay? This seems like a bad day for a fire drill. <laughs> Long-term cognitive 
effects. And, and um, so there, there are concerns that it may lead to a decreased ability to learn, that there might be trouble remembering new information in chronic users. Young adults and children may be more vulnerable to these effects. And there has been some concern that exposure before age 16 potentially could also increase the risk of mental illness, particularly schizophrenia. There certainly can be mood changes, and in fact that has increased with the higher amounts of THC in plants. There has been an increase in uh, people presenting to emergency rooms with anxiety and psychosis related to marijuana use. Other health problems, of course, if you smoke marijuana, there can be issues with chronic bronchitis or pharyngitis, airway <laughs> obstruction, and there are changes um, on our vital signs. Heart rate can increase for about two to three hours after exposure, and blood pressure can drop. Additional proposed concerns, lung cancer. This association is, is lacking. It is out there, but it is not true. Um, it turns out that the risk cancer in marijuana users is people who also smoke cigarettes or who mix their marijuana with uh, tobacco. There's a concern about motor vehicle accidents. And again, the evidence is not completely clear about alcohol use. During experiments, users tend to be actually safer drivers. They drive more slowly. They tend to overestimate their impairment, and they overcompensate by driving very slowly and really not changing lanes. Now, we all know as Philadelphia drivers that those are bad things. They could really get you into trouble. There are also risks for women. There are reproductive risks. Compounds in cannabis readily cross the placenta, and they're also present in breast. Cannabis use has been associated with low birth weight, developmental delay, behavioral problems, and including addiction in babies. Now, CBD, the health risks really are, we have limited safety data for long-term <coughs> use in humans. There are no known central nervous system effects of CBD. Also, there do not appear to be vital signs, even when you get doses up to 600 milligrams a day. There is a theoretical risk that it may affect the immune response, and in fact, that may actually play a role in why it's also useful. Um, affect some of the signals in the immune response. Now let's switch over to the law. The federal government regulates marijuana through the Controlled Substance Act, and it does not distinguish between recreational use and medical use of marijuana. As we said, it is classified as a Schedule I drug, meaning it has no recognized medical use. Violent law for even a first-time offense can result in a prison term, fines, or both. Here are the states that uh, have medical marijuana laws. There are 23 states, and it also includes the District of Columbia. And you can see Pennsylvania was not on that list. There are also states that have legalized recreational marijuana. So in Colorado on January 1st of this year, they legalized um, recreational use, and it's also uh, legalized in Washington state. Now for Pennsylvania, we have law SB 1182, um, which is a compassionate use of medical marijuana when it is approved by an attending physician. This was a bipartisan-sponsored bill by and Leach, who has been working tirelessly to get this approved, as well as Mike Fulmer, and it did pass the Senate in September 2014, but it still has a road ahead. And now I'd like to turn over the podium to Dr. Marsh. Thank you, Joyce, for setting this up for me. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me. There's two microphones here. That one off. Uh, for having me come and speak to you all today. And so I'm going to tell you now a little bit about the biology of the cannabinoids and then what is clinically known about their use for epilepsy, on, not on the media side, but on the, the clinical study side for the cannabinoids. 
So as Joy said, the marijuana plant contains over 70 cannabinoids. These are all um, molecularly very similar structures, but with different um, side chains and uh, different components of their, of their um, structure. So THC, as Joy said, which is tetrahydrocannabinol, is the most common one in the plant, in most uh, marijuana plants, and is the, plant, is the compound that is psychoactive. Uh, uh, um, cannabidiol, which is the one that's getting all the press, is the second most common cannabinoid in the plant, uh, and is not believed to be psychoactive. And you see they have very similar but uh, different structures. So the cannabinoids actually, and particularly THC, act in the body system through what's called the endocannabinoid system. So this is your naturally occurring system in your body that responds to molecules that are similar to the cannabinoids. So these are called the endocannabinoids. The endocannabinoids are produced by the breakdown of fats and lipids in your cells. So there are two main endocannabinoids which are molecularly similar to THC and these have long names called 2 arachidonyl glycerol and anandamide. I'm going to say those a couple times fast. Um, and the body, like I said, has enzymes to produce and metabolize these. And these are particularly produced within the synapses of the cells where there's electrical communication um, between cells. And there's you know, two main receptors in the body for these endocannabinoids, this arachidonic acid and the anandamides. And these receptors are called CB1 receptors, or cannabinoid receptor 1, and CB2 receptors. CB1 receptors are very abundant in the central nervous system. There are high levels in different parts of the body. They're very high in the hippocampus, the cortex, cerebellum, and basal ganglia, but there are low levels in the brain stem and other areas of the brain. Hence why marijuana is not actually respiratory depressing. So if you overdose on marijuana, you don't, you know, if you overdose on heroin, it kills you. If you overdose on marijuana, you actually just kind of lie there and you're fine. Um, well, not really, uh, but you won't die from an overdose of marijuana. It doesn't actually affect these receptors in the brainstem, so it doesn't shut down your respiration. So it's safe in that sense. Um, and these uh, CB1 receptors, modulate synaptic transmission. So they, you know, normal synaptic transmission occurs through glutamate or GABA, which are the two main neurotransmitters in the brain. But the CB1 receptors through these endocannabinoids make the glutamate transmission or the GABA transmission more or less depending on where they are. And the biology of this is very complex and actually not all that well understood. But the, um, but more and more people are trying to, to understand it. And then the CB2 receptors are actually not in the brain. They are primarily in the immune system. And this is why their marijuana is thought to have actually an anti-inflammatory anti or an immune-mediated response to its effect on receptors in T cells and B cells. So um, as I said, the endogenous uh, cannabinoids are produced in neurons. And their production gets increased when neural, neural activity is increased. And there are a set of different enzymes that both produce these cannabinoids, endocannabinoids and then metabolize them. And these can be modified in a variety of different ways, and it's one of the ways that CBD probably works. So the endogenous cannabinoids, as I said, modulate neuronal signaling, and they primarily are thought to decrease neurotransmitter release. So it would be a, an effect that would decrease the activity, which would be anti-epileptic in its nature. Um, but there are other experiments that say that the same endocannabinoids and binding to the CB1 receptors can actually be pro-activity and pro-epileptic in their nature. So the, the action of the CB1 receptor is varied depending on whether it's before the synapse or called presynaptic or postsynaptically, and depending on which cells in the brain and how it acts and at what time it acts. That is very complicated and is not fully understood at this point in time. So THC has basically one effect. THC binds to these CB1 receptors. THC is, I would call, a partial agonist to these receptors. So it binds and it competes with the endogenous endocannabinoids. And it alters synaptic function. 
it's altering synaptic function gives it its psychoactive properties. So by altering its synaptic function in the hippocampus, it alters memory, it slows time, it gives it the psychoactive, psychoactive properties, the high that one associates with marijuana. THC does this. Um, by doing this, it gives you the high. It pro probably results in pain reduction, um, reduces spasticity through its effect on the motor system, and enhances appetite. So the CB1, the, the THC's effect on the CB1 receptors modulates these properties of marijuana. But what I did not list here was its effect on epilepsy. So it's believed that the THC on its effect through CB1 receptors is not necessarily um, anti-epileptic and even could be pro-epileptic in certain situations. So as opposed to CHC, which has one major effect through the CB1 receptors, CBD or cannabidiol has multiple effects. And I'm only listing part of them here because some of these, these are the ones that are better studied and more well understood because many of the effects of CBD are not very, very well understood. So CBD binds both to CB1 and CB2 receptors with very low affinity. So THC binds with pretty high affinity. CBD binds to these receptors with affinity. And it's thought that CBD actually might block CB1 um, receptors, or at least block the endogenous endocannabinoids at the CB1 effect, uh, response. So in some ways, it could be counteracting the effect of THC, because it's going to compete with THC. And so plants that really get you high have high in THC and low in CBD. Plants that are high in CBD, even if it's high in THC, we're going to be less psychoactive and get you less high. So how does CBD work then if it doesn't work through these CB1 receptors? Well, this is the part where there's more and more data occurring about this. But um, what I'm going to tell you are what's believed to be the case right now. So one, CBD is thought to block sodium channels. So CBD, how it blocks it, it's not clear, but it's thought to have a fairly potent effect on sodium channels. So if anyone knows anything about Dravet syndrome, so Dravet syndrome is thought to be, uh, in many cases, a mutation in the sodium channel. And sodium channel drugs like Dilantin or Tegretol are thought to be bad for Dravet syndrome. So why would CBD be good for it? Well, we don't understand that because we don't really understand how it works through that. CBD also alters neuronal signaling in the CB1 receptor. So it alters calcium signaling um, through a variety of different mechanisms, um, such as acting on the GPR55, the GPR55 antagonists. It blocks channels called TRBP channels, and these are really interesting channels. We can have a whole nother lecture on that, but um, they're channels that are pain and heat sensation and febrile seizures possibly, um, but CB, well, CBD probably acts to alter the, the activity of these different channels. And then it also is thought to alter calcium signaling by its effect on mitochondria. Um, mitochondria are the main energy pumps in all of your cells, and CBD is thought to block mitochondrial uptake into this, which would alter calcium signaling within neurons. So it blocks, um, it alters uh, sodium channels, it blocks calcium signaling, it has effects on serotonin receptors, and then it also has these neuroprotective anti-inflammatory effects, and those are thought to be through the CB2 receptors. And those, I said, again, are not in the brain, they're in the peripheral, um, in your immune system. And uh, it is thought through some of this that it can have anti-inflammatory effects, and as many of you probably know, there's an increasing uh, evidence and uh, interest in the, the action of the inflammatory system in epilepsy, and that uh, inflammation might have a role either in generating or, or continuing seizures to go on. So it's a CBD's effect through this immune system, immune-mediated uh, aspect could be very important as well. And then lastly, CBD is, an, is a potent antioxidant. So it might have neuroprotective effects through its role as an antioxidant. So a lot of information, and this is still really being nailed down, because it's really not 100% clear exactly how CBD is working, and particularly how it's possibly being a anti-epileptic drug. So that, that's the biology of the endocannabinoid system and the um, cannabinoids in CBD, very briefly. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the preclinical data. So data not in humans, but in mice and rabbits and such. Um, <laughs> Not that Mickey or Bugs would ever do this. Um, 
So there's some very early preclinical data. So there's, like Joyce said, the, you, the interest in uh, marijuana as a medicinal substance has been around since the ancient Chinese time. And in, after THC was purified in the 60s, people started having interest in what is the effect of marijuana, how does it work? And at that time, in the 60s, all the different cannabinoids were starting to be purified, so people started working on CBD because it was the next highest prevalent cannabinoid in the plant. So in the, in the 1970s and 1980s, there's been a series of papers published that looked at CBD in animal models of seizures. And CBD was effective in four different models uh, where they gave uh, seizures by um, electrically stimulating the animals. And uh, it was also affected, effective in different electric shock uh, models. And so the figure on the left there shows on the y-axis, the up and down axis, the number of animals who would convulse if you give them a shock. And then on the right axis, the, the x-axis, gives the amount of electricity it would require for those animals to have um, seizures. And if you look at the open circles, the open circles are the control animals where they're not giving any medication, any CBD. And in that, if you look up uh, at the topmost circle, by 15 volts, 80% of the animals had seizures. But when they treated those animals, or they pre-treated those animals with um, cannabidiol, either a single treatment right before it or a series of um, subacute treatments before it, they saw that this curve shifted to the right. So now, in order to get 85% of the animals to seize, you either had to give 20 volts or 25 volts of electricity. So significantly uh, more electricity than it would require for the control animals. Showing that, in this particular example, CBD was effective in preventing or reducing the, the epileptic effect of giving an animal um, uh, a shock. So, there's other pre uh, preclinical data to support that CBD is effective. So in the last five or so years, there's been an increased interest in this, so there's been more and more studies that have been done. Some examples are listed on the bottom, some references are on the bottom there. So people have been looking now at different types of models and also reproducing the data that was done in the 60s and 70s, because you know, we know so much more now, so you have to reproduce that was what was done. Turns out most of the data from the 60s and 70s was correct, which is often what happens in medicine. What the correct. So here they've now done this in um, both electrical uh, um, models, like we did in the past, but also um, chemical models. So for there are many, many different models of epilepsy. There are some that where you give shocks, as I said, but there are also some drugs that you can give an animal to cause it to convulse. And when you can do that, you can also they convulse immediately when you give the drug, but then later continued seizures. So it's a very good model of mimicking like epilepsy after head trauma or epilepsy after um, status epileptus or uh, meningitis. And in those models, many of these uh, CBD at different doses has been shown to be effective. So, you know, again, on the left, on the upper panel, they gave um, electric shocks and then treated the animals with either vehicle or different doses of CBD and found that they could get up to a 50% reduction in seizures uh, with different of CBD. But importantly, when they did this study, this was an interesting study, because they also not, didn't want to just look at how CBD was as an anti-seizure drug, they also looked at how CBD had side effects in the animals. So what they did is they put the animals on a spinning wheel, like a lumberjack on a log, and they had the mice run on the spinning wheel and saw how quickly they fall off. And so if the mice were stoned or high, they should fall off this wheel very quickly, but even at the highest dose, or 200 milligrams per kilogram of CBD, the time to fall off that road was no different than the controls, suggesting that CBD had very little psychoactive effect on these animals. So there's, I said, a number of studies now that have shown that CBD is effective both in electrical models and chemically induced models, but in these animals seems to have very little uh, side effects. So it, it's promising that CBD actually could be a decent anti-epileptic uh, drug. Though, like everything else in science, nothing's perfectly 100% clear. Um, there have been some studies that say, no, 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 CBD actually is not a good anti-epileptic. And that, um, as I said, this one study showed that CBD blocked voltage-gated sodium channels. A couple of studies have shown that. 
Um, but in this one study that showed that it worked on sodium channels, and the figure on the left is what they did to show that, that um, sodium channels produce action potentials. Those big spiky things there are the action potentials when they, when they um, record from a cell. And CBD blocked the number of actions showing that it affects um, sodium channels. But when they did this, they also then induced seizures with a chemical model of pilocarpine, and they found that it had no effect on that. So there is a couple studies out there which have said that CBD actually does not have an effect, and there are a whole bunch more, many more studies that show that it does have an effect. But it's not 100% that CBD is this perfect anti-epileptic drug. So this is an overview of kind of the, the preclinical data that's out there. So now we're going to move on to the clinical data that's out there. What is known about the use of CBD or THC in um, humans with epilepsy? So as uh, Joy said, there is um, some older data, some that anecdotes here and there that CBD could be effective. Um, C P CBD or THC could be effective. So there was a small study um, in 1949, where they gave THC to five institutionalized children who had failed phenobarbital and um, phenytoin. And of these five children who they gave THC, the doses they gave, how they gave it, it's One became seizure-free, one was almost seizure-free, and three had no change. So two out of five, not great, but evidence that it might be anti-epileptic. Um, in 1975, another study was done where they treated a young man um, with epilepsy who was on both phenobarbital and um, dilantin, <coughs> phenytoin, and that led to him uh, being seizure-free with his AEDs. When they tried to take off his AEDs, his seizures came back. So it worked well in conjunction with his AEDs. And then, um, more recently, in the 2000s, there's been increasing case reports of seizure reduction um, with, C with THC or CBD, but also in recreational use of marijuana, there's reports of increasing seizures um, with recreational marijuana. Um, and then someone who was using marijuana a lot, who stopped their marijuana, having withdrawal seizures from it. So when you think about just rec Marijuana you can get off the street, which is high in THC, the data is plus minus. It's not terrific. So in 2014, because of the, the interest that has been generated because of the original Sanjay Gupta report and the Charlotte's Web video, which I do um, viewing, if you haven't seen it, most of you probably have seen it. I do love the beginning of the video because the doctor in it, he must be an actor, he doesn't say he is, but he's this, you know, uh, older gentleman with a full head of gray hair who sits there, and what you're about to see is remarkable. You know, it's, it's, it really seems like it was produced, but it's worth watching, definitely worth watching. But because of all this hype that these did, um, COP, which is an organization that reviews the medical literature and does what's called meta-analysis. It looks across all different studies in the, in the medical literature, and it tries to put them together in a way that makes sense. So their thought is that each individual study might only have so much power to answer a question. If you composite studies, you get a lot more from it. And they do it in a very um, regulated way. They have rules they use when they do these composite studies. And so they try to do this for CBD in just this, uh, in April. This came out. So they uh, published this data. And unfortunately, they could only find four randomized reports with 48 patients in total. So the data is very limited for this. This was using CBD. They were trying to do either um, marijuana high in CBD or pure CBD as the treatment. Um, in all these four studies, the patients can use current anti-epileptic drugs, and no statistical tests were used. These weren't blinded controlled trials. These were observational studies. And their comment was these, all these four studies were of low quality and what's considered low quality is that they're observational, blinded, they're not randomized, that type of thing. So these are the four studies that they were able to pull the data from. They actually went as far back as trying to actually get the original um, data sets from some of these groups, from the, uh, the 1978 study. And in these, the patients were either nine in the 1978 study, up to 15 in the 1980 study. 
Um, these, they put four patients on placebo, I'm sorry, five on placebo, four on CBD, seven on CBD, eight on placebo. So these were um, not randomized, but they were controlled studies. And they found for the 1778 study, five of the treated patients with CBD, um, two became seizure-free, sorry, four, it's a typo. Two became seizure-free, um, one had, was better, one unchanged. And placebo, they were unchanged and they said there was no adverse events. And that kind of pattern holds for all that they had some patients with response, um, some with no response, none of the placebos had any response, but they were all pretty safe, that they didn't find any really adverse events in any of these 48 patients. So it was pretty safe to treat, but they really can't comment on the efficacy with these studies. Then there are also some indirect data and this again goes back to just general marijuana use, not specific to CBD. But if you actually, there was a study by Gross in 2004 where they looked at marijuana use amongst people in their clinic. So they asked everyone who came into their clinic, do you use marijuana? Definitely do you use marijuana? And they had up to 48% of the patients in their clinic use marijuana. 21% were active users. 15% had used it in the last month. And then they looked at the patient's reports of their seizure severity. So, you know, if you're using too much marijuana, how well do you remember what your seizures were? But, um, so this study has limitations. But what they found was that um, about 68% said that uh, their seizures improved when they took marijuana. Um, none said it worsened, and about 32% had said it had no effect uh, for the severity of the seizures. For the frequency of their seizures, it was a wash. About 54% said it improved, 46% said it had no effect. And some said it improved their medication side effects, some said it worsened their medication, and most said it had no effect on their medication side effects. So variable, but again, this is recreational use of marijuana, not marijuana high in CBD, and it's unclear what these um, people were giving themselves. So what do we know about this in pediatrics? So this is, you know, the, a lot of the focus of this in the news and media is in pediatrics, is in these conditions called Dravet syndrome and lannis gastaut syndrome. And so about this. Well, until 2013, my friend Brenda Porter, she moved out to, she was at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, went to Stanford to become the head of the pediatric epilepsy program out there. And it's actually funny, so Brenda is, I don't know if anyone had ever met Dr. Porter, straight-laced person and she moves out to California and about uh, two months out to California she gives me a call and she goes can we treat your mice with pot I'm like you just moved to California and you're doing pot already I mean come on what's going on here and she said no not me not me but all these patients are taking it and we actually see that there might be some effect so what they went and did is they actually um, put out a survey on a Facebook support uh, book page for people in California who were using medical marijuana for their children. And they had over 150 friends on this support group page for medical marijuana for epilepsy. And of those 150, 20 um, agreed to fill out the survey. So not a great response in filling out the survey, but 20 filled out the survey. These were 19 children, ages two to 16 years of age. They all were supposed to be taking CBD-enriched marijuana uh, with one to 22 milligrams per kilogram per day of CBD. 13 of these patients had Dravet syndrome, four with something called uh, myoclonic aesthetic epilepsy, or MAE. Um, the other two had just mixed seizure disorders. And they found that 84% by parental report through this survey had a significant reduction in their seizure frequency. Two of the patients reported that they became seizure free. Um, eight or 42% had a greater than 80% seizure reduction in their seizures and six uh, had somewhere between a 25 and 50% reduction. So a, pretty pro a fairly positive response from the survey, but very limited. It's a survey, well, do you remember all the, the caveats that come into a study like this? Not only did they saw this positive response in seizures, but they also reported that the family said that the children's moods were better, their alertness was better, they slept better, but it wasn't all perfect, there were side effects. 37% said they were more drowsy, so how that fits with alertness, it's unclear. 16% um, had fatigue, so there were side effects of this, um, taking uh, marijuana high in CBD. And 
they then said, well, you know, is this just a bias? So they tried to figure out a way to make sure that they weren't completely biased. They actually did a survey for steropentol. So steropentol is an anti-epileptic drug that's approved in Canada, Europe, most of the world, but not approved in the United States. And it's used specifically for Dravet syndrome. And it's really thought to actually work best with seropentyl in combination with clobazam or Onfi, um, as well as with Depakote, and the to be effective for um, seizures in children with Dravet. So they did the same report uh, to see if they would get this biased results. And they found very similar results to CPD. So they don't think their, their, their uh, study was completely biased. Um, so besides that study uh, and these earlier um, clinical studies, there's very little data out there. Most recently, and being presented at this year's uh, AES um, meeting, which is in December, an abstract was just released for this meeting, which is titled The Efficacy and Safety of Epidiolex, which is CBD produced by a company called GW Pharmaceuticals, which is a British company, in children with a treatment-resistant epilepsy. And the, on the abstract is only, um, I don't know, I'm drunk, like the number of patients. I think there was uh, 27 patients on the abstract, but there was, there's five studies, including us at CHOP, who are putting patients together for this study. And this is an open-label study. It's an expanded access program. So each site by themselves put out uh, a request for the FDA to give CBD to patients with intractable epilepsy. The FDA does have a mechanism to allow you to treat um, patients who, are at, who have no other options with non-FDA approved drugs, and this is the mechanism to do that. So five different sites um, did this, and we're all in different stages of going through this. The first um, 27 patients that came through this at NYU and at UCSF in California were presented in this abstract. We actually present the full poster in, um, in Seattle. In December, we'll actually have many more patients because many of our patients now at CHOP, we just didn't, weren't through them in time to put them in the abstract. So the patients treated, um, Dravet syndrome was the most common diagnosis, myoclonic absence epilepsy, or MAE, was the next most common, and these other diagnoses that are listed there. On average, the patients had 2.7 um, other AEDs they were taking along with the CBD. And this is what they found. Um, this came out a little funny. Uh, so the median seizure frequency at baseline was 28 seizures per day. Um, this is between four and 50, oh sorry, per month, sorry, not per day, per month. Um, 28 seizures per month, and it was between four and 1,578 seizures. This includes myoclonic seizures, which are very brief, it's not just convulsions. And then when you looked at month three, and you looked at the median seizure frequency, it dropped to 11 from uh, 28, with a range now from zero to 245. So uh, an apparent reduction. When you look at the responder rates, so those with greater than 50% reduction in seizures, 40% um, or 39% had greater than 50% reduction. So the shift you see in that first number is because a, a, a about 40% of the patients had this dramatic, uh, more dramatic change. Um, the mean reduction from baseline per patient was 32%, and four of these 27 patients became seizure-free. So 17% of the patients became seizure-free. Again, this is an open-label study. It's not controlled. It was parental report. So there's caveats to the study, but 17% became seizure-free, which is a, a fairly high number for an add-on uh, trial like this. Look at the Dravet syndrome patients, 33% became seizure-free. So three of the nine Dravet patients became seizure-free, with 44% um, having greater than 50% reduction. So this data mimics the data from the, the um, Porter and Jacobson uh, um, survey that there seems to be a signal here, that CBD definitely seems to do something, but these studies you know, have caveats because of the way they're performed. And when you look at the side effects of these 27 patients, um, there were 78% had some adverse event. And the common adverse events were, again, sleepiness, fatigue, increases in the AEDs, decreased appetite, increased appetite, so how that is, it's unclear, um, diarrhea, weight loss, 
So it's not completely benign. Giving CBD induces side effects. It causes other issues. It's not completely benign like the media wants you to make you think. It has, it's a real drug. It has effects on uh, the body besides its effect on seizures. So what's going on now? So as Joy said, um, what's really important is doing studies and trying to figure out how effective is CBD? Um, does it really work? Does it work better than what we have? Is it safe? And so there are a bunch of uh, studies that are about to start or have been started. So GW Pharmaceuticals is one of the companies that's doing these studies. It's been doing this expanded access program. They've actually increased from five sites to 11 sites around the country doing this expanded access program, each with 25 patients. And they're starting industry studies. And these are randomized placebo-controlled studies. So they're doing one for Gervais syndrome, and that one's actually starting to enroll in one site. Uh, we're hopefully gonna get it off the ground very soon at CHOP. Um, and it will be a randomized placebo-controlled uh, study. And then they're gonna do a similar randomized placebo-controlled study with lennox gastaut syndrome, which they hope to get started sometime this winter. There's another pharmaceutical company who has a, so GW, um, their CBD is extracted from the plant, but like any molecule, you can synthesize it. Um, and there's another pharmaceutical company who has plans for using a synthetic CBD and their studies they hope to get um, going by this winter as well. So there'll be two different companies performing um, randomized placebo-controlled trials on CBD. Uh, and so by next year, this time, there should be some data out there of controlled trials to say, how effective really is CBD when it's done in the, appro the appropriate uh, way? So what can we conclude from this? That there's, there's evidence, but not conclusive, that uh, CBD is effective in people for treating seizures. Um, all studies to date suggest it's well, though there are side effects. And this contra contrasts to THC contain containing compounds that get you high and have significant um, uh, psychoactive associated with it, and the long-term effects, especially in the developing brain, of THC are, are concerning. So as uh, Dr. Brouch said, as Joy said, there's long-term effects of CBD in the young, of THC in the young brain could be very concerning. Um, do. And these uh, studies have been challenged because of, this is a Schedule One substance. So just to give you just an anecdote, with our study at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, because it's a Schedule One substance, it has to be kept in a specific locked cabinet that only two pharmacists in the whole hospital have access to. I have to it myself or one of our nurses who only two of us or three of us are allowed to do this because we've been had background checks from the, from the DEA to go down and pick up the medication by hand. No one else can pick it up. We have to walk it up and give it to the family and then the family can't give it to anyone else. Someone else, they're dispensing a Schedule One substance that they can go to jail. So it's crazy that for a drug that's not even psychoactive, we have to go through this rigmarole. And that makes doing a study really challenging because it takes time and effort and money to get a Schedule One license, so this is difficult to do. Um, the public perception of this actually makes this difficult too because there's bias. I mean, can't, families are coming into this with a bias that this is gonna work. I mean, Sanjay Gupta said it's gonna work. Of course it's gonna work, you know, and, and, and that, that it creates problems in studies because people have biases going into it. So the studies that have been done to date, which are open label, are inherently difficult because of parental bias coming into this. And you say, well, how do you have bias when someone's having a convulsion? Well, you know, you don't see it. You sleep better, so you don't know of that night because you're thinking you're, it's working for your child. So there's ways that there's bias that these numbers that I presented could be off. And that's why, you know, double-blinded, placebo-controlled studies, and they're needed now, and it's gonna happen, which is the good um, uh, news, that these placebo-controlled studies are gonna happen, and if they're shown to be effective, then the government would have no choice but to, at least for CPD, release, reduce its, um, uh, its scheduling, move it back to Schedule Two or Schedule II, but then it will allow it to be prescribed and handled in an appropriate fashion. And so these things are, are needed now. I think that's, we'll stop with that. Um, do we have questions?
Right. So, right. So. Right. So CBD um, is what it does interact with other medications. CBD affects what's called the, the um, in the liver, there's the liver metabolism system, the CYP system. CBD actually inhibits a few of the enzymes that alter different drugs. So like any other medication you take, um, the doctor, whatever doctor you're going to has to know that you're on this because they have to interact with other medications and deal with it appropriately. So whether if it's for anesthesia or for any other medication you're gonna be um, prescribed, your doctor needs to know you're taking CBD because it needs to know how it interacts. Just like if you're on Dilantin and you're given an, a, a antibiotic, your doctor needs to know that, it would be no different with CBD. It would be important for your doctor to know. Are you currently doing a study with pediatrics and CBD? You currently? So we are, are we have an open access no, study. No, I'm asking you personally, are you? Yes. So, so that's actually not true. That's a, a so the, the, back in the 60s, the government um, patented, a, a individual lab patented um, a bunch of these compounds. Those compounds have all expired. Um, patents only last for 17 years. And so that, that's not true. The government's not doing this. You know, there's no governor, government conspiracy no, here. No, Right. Yeah. But I have, I have heard that, and since you had to go through the background check, I'm like, I can go to the DEA, and why can't I receive it? So it's so messy. Grass and straws. Right. So that this, a lot of people are in your situation, and this is why we're doing these studies um, to get the information to see whether this really works. Because if it doesn't work. It should not be, the schedule shouldn't be changed, nothing should be changed, and we should continue to continue, use marijuana as, or consider marijuana as a Schedule One substance. We shouldn't alter um, the way it's perceived. If it does work, it's a different story. So the studies need to be done, and that's what's most important, that we need to do real studies on this. Um, well, there's no doubt that uh, CBD is effective. The, the question is, uh, with clones, my question is about 100 years from now. Um, in 100 years from now, will will um, will you be able to determine? Well, will doctors be able to determine by e by a series of tests, either blood tests, neurological tests, um, uh, etc., genetic tests, uh, whether whether CBD will be effective with with, with a particular person? It's it's a great question. So you know, your first statement that CBD is effective, I, I think, you know, we don't, we, it has hints that it's effective. We don't know for sure that it's effective. I have no doubt that it's effective with certain people, <laughs> under certain circumstances, with certain conditions. Well, okay. Um, but I think as a whole, we're not sure of that yet. But um, the answer to the other part of your question, for who and will there be tests to do that, people are, we're actually starting to think about that and do some of those type of studies with um, these randomized controlled trials to see if you can pull out if it's effective, who it's effective with. And that we haven't done yet, but I think that's going to be not just true for CBD, but for any anti-epileptic drug or anything else. I think it was that. Um, we actually were not going to take questions okay. with this. Anymore. All right. No, are we out of time yet? Yeah.
Okay, because we've ended early, which has never happened before ever in the lifetime of the conference, um, we are um, we are going to extend our uh, our break a little bit because we do have a lot of vendors and interesting people that um, we'd like you to see, and there are refreshments.